All right. Well, hello, everyone. And I would like to go ahead and welcome and get started with this week's Grand Rounds. This week is a special joint Grand Rounds for both the Department of Medicine and the Department of Global Health. And so Jason's going to provide a brief intro to this lecture series. Sure. Thank you. So as Johnny mentioned, my name is Jason Besty, and I'm an infectious disease physician in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Disease and in the Department of Global Health at UW. And I just want to say on behalf of the Department of Global Health, I'd like to welcome all of you to our second joint Global Health Grand Rounds of this academic year, which is co-hosted by the Department of Medicine and the Department of Global Health. We're thrilled to have Dr. Warren speak to us today because he's a leader in promoting and advocating access to cancer, cancer care in global health, which is such a large burden around the world. We're looking forward to continuing these joint Global Health Grand Rounds with the Department of Medicine in the future. And if you're interested in attending other Global Health related Grand Rounds with other clinical departments across the UW, please visit the UW Department of Global Health website for more information. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Johnny. Thanks so much, Dr. Vesey. Uh, as you said, uh, we are so excited for our speaker today, Dr. Hootie Warren, a renowned researcher who's been with the Fred Hutch for 28 years, starting with his fellowship in medical oncology. He's the current program head of global oncology and the professor in the clinical research and vaccine and infectious disease divisions at the Fred Hutch. He's a medical oncologist at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance with a practice focused on patients with lymphoma. He completed both his undergraduate and graduate medical education at Harvard and Boston before being inspired by Dr. Donald Thomas's Nobel Prize Award to move here to Seattle and progress the care of patients with leukemia and lymphoma. And since arriving here, he has designed and led Fred Hutch's first clinical trial of T-cell therapy for patients with leukemia. He co-invented with the Fred Hutch colleagues a high-throughput sequencing technology that enables researchers to see how the millions of different T-cells in each individual are program to target diseases. He also runs a lab focused on cancer immunology with a particular interest in the cellular and molecular mechanisms that mediate cancer regression after immune-based therapy. Since 2017, Dr. Warren has served as head of the global oncology program at Fred Hutch, the primary focus of which is the operation of a 30,000 uh, square foot cancer research center located in Kampala, Uganda on the campus of the Uganda Cancer Institute. The Fred Hutch and UCI have a longstanding collaboration centered on the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of cancers that are prevalent in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're so excited to learn more. Dr. Warren, thank you so much for agreeing to be with us as our second uh, global health and department of Grand Round, uh, medicine Grand Rounds lecture. Just so that you know, we will uh, have the chat open throughout the presentation to the audience for any questions. And we'll have a little bit of time there at the end to sort of do a moderated Q&A based on any questions that come in through the chat. Go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you, Johnny and Jason, for the kind words and the generous um, invitation to present uh, to the Departments of Medicine and, and Global Health. I've been a proud member of the Department of Medicine for uh, those 28 years that I've been here in Seattle. And uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful and, and remarkable, important uh, department indeed. And so uh, just to begin with, I'd like to let you all know I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, the, the topic really is uh, global cancer and the collaboration that Johnny described that the Fred Hutch has with the Uganda Cancer Institute. I thought I'd set the scene with some, some facts and figures about the global burden of cancer. Uh, these global maps here indicate the most common types of cancer uh, occurring each year in males and females. You can see that in men, it's mostly prostate cancer and uh, lung cancer. Um, in Uganda, you can see right here, it's actually Kaposi's sarcoma. For females, it's breast cancer followed uh, by cervical cancer. Uh, as far as cancer deaths are concerned, lung cancer remains the single most important cause of cancer death worldwide. But um, the number of uh, lung cancer deaths hopefully will, will peak and, uh, and uh, start decreasing. Um, unfortunately, that will then um, really uh, force us to refocus on the, the other important cancers whose uh, incidence is alarming, most notably breast cancer, which will become the most common cause of cancer death across the world and cervical cancer. Uh, once again, I just wanted to um, uh, highlight that um, yeah, back here in, in Uganda, the most common cause of uh, cancer death in females is cervical cancer. Um, 
different. Uh, uh, one thing that distinguishes cancer as we experience it here in North America and in Sub-Saharan Africa is that a far larger proportion of the cancers we see in Sub-Saharan Africa are attributable in one way or another to uh, infections and pathogen associated cancers comprise 30% uh, of cancers across Sub-Saharan Africa um, and in up to 40% uh, in certain countries down here. And uh, of those, the most common are due to four pathogens, really, uh, hepatitis C virus, hepatitis B virus, human papilloma virus, and helicobacter pylori. And in fact, uh, as I said, 30% of the cancers in sub-Saharan Africa are due to pathogens uh, with, and in contrast, less than 5% of those here in Seattle and across North America um, uh, have that characteristic. Here's my rogues gallery of infectious agents causing cancer. And I've already pointed out that globally, the four most important are HPV, HPV, HCV, and Helicobacter pylori. I'm not gonna talk much about the, these today. I'm gonna to focus on a couple of others that we study fairly intensively at the Uganda Cancer Institute uh, and Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Kampala, Epstein-Barr virus and Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus. Um, HIV doesn't cause cancer per se that we know of, but people living with HIV infection demonstrate a very uh, much increased rate of specific cancers. There are three AIDS defining cancers, cervical cancer, non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Kaposi sarcoma, the risk for which is enormously elevated by concurrent HIV infection. But there are a number of other cancers that occur far more commonly in people living with HIV infection than uh, in those who do not have HIV infection. And prominent amongst those are anal cancer, liver cancer, lung cancer, and Hodgkin and lymphoma. And in fact, uh, in people living with HIV in this country and in uh, uh, high income countries, lung cancer is one of the leading causes of death in, um, in that group. Prevalence of HIV infection across the group across the globe, everyone in this audience know, knows well that the vast majority of the world's 38 million uh, uh, individuals who are living with HIV infection are located on the African continent. And in certain parts of Southern Africa, the uh, uh, fraction of the adult population with HIV infection exceeds 25 or 30%. And so the HIV associated cancers are of enormous importance on the African continent. Um, as uh, Johnny mentioned, uh, the Fred Hutch has for quite some time operated in full collaboration with the Uganda Cancer Institute, a brick and mortar cancer research center on the grounds of the Uganda Cancer Institute in Kampala, Uganda. We call this the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center and that brick and mortar structure is right here. Uh, you can see that it looks a lot like the the Fred Hutch campus uh, down here in Southeast Lake Union. And uh, that's uh, actually uh, uh, no accident whatsoever. Um, the collaboration goes back at least 17 years to 2004 when Drs. Corey and Casper uh, in AID really started joint research with uh, collaborators at the UCI on the high incidence of pathogen associated cancers there. And I've illustrated some of the highlights of the collaboration over the subsequent 17 years. I want to focus on 2008 when we formalized uh, this particular collaboration to, uh, and for partnership to focus on biomedical research, training, and clinical care. 2011, when we broke ground on the $10 million UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center that I just showed you in the previous slide. 2015, when it was opened with a great uh, ceremony by the president of Uganda, President uh, 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 Museveni. Um, uh, three years later, we launched our East African Adult Hematology Oncology Fellowship Program that I'll tell you a lot more about uh, in a few minutes. 2020, um, as uh, probably everyone else has experienced, was not one of our best years, but um, one of which, um, one in which I, I, I couldn't have been prouder of the people that make up our global oncology program for the way they, they face the challenges um, that were posed by the pandemic. Uh, all research activity at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center that did not provide immediate benefit to patients 
was uh, uh, suspended in March of 2020, uh, not long after the uh, global pandemic exploded. Um, and uh, all research activity remained suspended until September 2020. So we were shut down almost entirely for six months in the year 2020. And uh, since then, we've been uh, ramping up, uh, ramping back up as rapidly as possible. A key important um, uh, activity that let us do that was uh, establishing SARS-CoV-2 testing at the UCI Fetish Cancer Center in collaboration and coordination with the Ministry of Health in Uganda. Um, to really protect our research participants and our research staff. And I, I, I can't thank our laboratory staff. This is the, the group of fine individuals uh, whom we taught how to perform safe SARS-CoV-2 via Zoom uh, over 8,000 miles and 11 time zones. And uh, I, uh, my hat is off to these fine young people for all that they've done and continue to do day in and day out. And, and lest you worry that they're um, compromising physical distancing here, uh, they only got this close together for a few seconds long enough to take the picture. Um, so you might ask, why does the Fred Hutch do cancer research abroad? There are a number of very good reasons. It gives us the opportunity to study globally important cancers that are rare or uncommon in the US, particularly infection-related cancers, as uh, I've already uh, identified a few good examples for you. Pediatric Burkitt lymphoma, Kaposi's C sarcoma, both of which are very common in sub-Saharan Africa, nasopharyngeal carcinoma in Southern China and Southeast Asia. Uh, I won't have time to talk about that today, but that's um, uh, an extremely common cancer uh, in certain parts of the world that we really don't see here much uh, in Seattle. There's a need for better understanding of global heterogeneity and the genetics and biology of common cancers, as well as, as the genomics of different populations. And I'll touch upon that briefly. Uh, in a few minutes. This is particularly relevant for the common epithelial malignancies such as breast, lung, and gastrointestinal cancers. And then of course, there's always the, the anticipation and hope that, they're, uh, that these studies will lead to reciprocal innovation, namely that lessons learned abroad will have applicability to cancer care in low resource settings in the US. Um, and uh, that obviously is um, very true and uh, um, uh, enormously meaningful for the whammy area and uh, areas in which uh, studies in Uganda might, might help us here in, in the whammy area include point of care direct diagnostics and oral chemotherapy regimens. Um, those reasons aside, I think from the personal point of view, one of the things that really motivates what I do and makes me, um, makes me get up and do what I do every day is the following uh, the following fact that the world of 2021 has 7.7 .7 billion people. Uh, I came out to Seattle in the previous millennium, as was mentioned, to pursue my medical oncology fellowship. The world, uh, the world of oncology has undergone a remarkable transformation in those intervening 28 years. And um, oncology as it's practiced now has no resemblance whatsoever to oncology as it was practiced in in 1993 when I got here. Um, that said, unfortunately, only the, the less than 1 billion people who live in the blue areas on this map really have, excuse me, really have access uh, to that revolution uh, in oncology and oncology care. And what, um, what I hope global oncology can contribute to is, is um, devising ways that will, that will help uh, deliver and extend access to this oncology revolution to the seven point so billion people who can't yet uh, benefit from it. And of course, that's not going to be easy because uh, across the globe, total health expenditures per capita are enormously uh, variable. Uh, here in the US, we spend over $10,000 per capita uh, per year. And in most of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, as you can see, that the corresponding figure is left less than uh, $50. And uh, you can, as you might imagine, it's very difficult to buy uh, a lot of high quality cancer care on $50 per head. Um, to get to the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center, um, all you have to do is uh, uh, walk out the door and head northeast uh, toward Greenland. 
this is the Great Circle route that connects Seattle and Entebbe, which is the airport uh, nearest Kampala. And of course, the route, that Great Circle route takes you northeast, north of Hudson Bay, across Baffin Island, the lower part of Greenland, Iceland, to the east of the UK. You touch down in Amsterdam, change planes, then slice down through Central Europe, across Italy, across the Sahara Desert, and then finally into Entebbe, 8,000 uh, miles later. And it's a fascinating trip because you have the opportunity to cross the 5,000 foot uh, uh, thick Greenland uh, ice cap and the Sahara Desert uh, within a, the space of a few hours always um, really makes you appreciate how small a planet we really live on. Um, nonetheless, I want to emphasize that Africa is not a monolithic entity. It's an enormous continent and uh, uh, displays uh, enormous heterogeneity in so many important dimensions. Um, the size of Africa is immense. And so I just this figure illustrates that Africa is as large as the United States, China, India, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, uh, and Japan put together. It's 4,500 miles, as some of you uh, probably well know, between uh, Dakar, Senegal, and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And um, the heterogeneity uh, encompassed within the African continent um, really uh, is beyond description. Um, Africa is very important for another reason. Um, within a few years, um, most of the world's population will live in Africa. Right at the moment in 2021, the African population is about 1.4 billion. That's a comparable to India and China. But the African population is expected to triple over the balance of this century and reach 4.2 billion uh, by 2100. And so the implications of that for global health are enormous. And, uh, and um, we really need to start thinking about how we're going to meet the challenges posed by that population growth. Africa is also very, very uh, genetically heterogeneous. And, um, I'd like to just yeah, explain why this is um, a, a figure that really describes um, and emphasizes that most of the world was peopled by a relatively small uh, number of individuals in a few bands that um, were living in the area of current Ethiopia and about 55 to 65,000 years ago, migrated out of Africa and thereafter uh, spread over uh, all of the continents and, and populated the rest of the world. When, that, when those um, migration events occurred, we think 55 to 65,000 years ago, the, the human population on the African continent was already extremely diverse genetically. And the migrant, migrant bands that left Africa and populated the rest of the world collectively captured or carried only a tiny fraction of the genetic diversity that, was, that already existed on the African continent. And that's something very, very important to remember. That, that is very well illustrated by the results of the Thousand Genomes Project, which did uh, whole genome sequencing in a thousand, ended up being more than a thousand individuals from six different well-characterized populations uh, uh, across the globe. There were six African or African origin populations. And as you can see in the lower corner, the number of variant sites per genome for these six populations um, is entirely non-overlapping with the variant sites per genome of the other 20. Um, really bringing home and emphasizing how genetically diverse the uh, African populations are. And in fact, much of that genetic variation that uh, exists in Africa is private to the continent, i.e. it's not found uh, elsewhere uh, in the globe. Um, that unfortunately has had a, um, what I think is a negative effect on the uh, enormous efforts that have been made over the last 20 years to explore how genetic variation in the human genome influences health and disease. This is a beautiful uh, scientific, scientometric study 
of all the GWAS studies published from 27, uh, 2007 to 2017. And you can, in, uh, you can see that the number of uh, individuals of African origin who contributed uh, to these studies uh, really uh, uh, is almost invisible, far less than uh, three tenths of 1%. And in fact, most of the world's population is not covered by current GWAS, which is another uh, finding from that particular study. We understand genetic variation uh, of populations in the US and Iceland and the UK uh, far better, orders of magnitude better uh, than we understand how genetic variation um, uh, affects health and disease for the other 95% of the population. Uh, getting to Uganda, the Pearl of Africa, where the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center is located, the population is just about 45 million now, and it's growing extremely quickly, 3.3% uh, per year. It's about, Uganda is about twice the size of Pennsylvania, slightly uh, less than the size of Oregon. Its prim population is primarily rural, about 84 to 85%. Uh, but it's urbanizing quickly as is the rest of the African continent. Uh, life expectancy is 60 and 65 for males and females respectively. The GDP per capita was under $2,000 in 2020. Um, healthcare expenditure per capita, as I showed you, less than $50 a year. 15% um, of the population has access to electricity and 79% has access to what we co would uh, uh, call an improved uh, water source. One of the interesting things about the uh, Ugandan population structure is that it, it displays the characteristic uh, youth bulge. 33% of the Ugandan population of 45 million is under 10 years old. 86% of the Ugandan population is under 40 years old. That contrasts enormously with the population structure, say, of the United States and even uh, contrasts uh, more um, dramatically with populations of countries such as, say, Italy and Japan, where there are far more um, individuals in the older cohorts, cohorts than there are in the younger cohorts. And that has more important implications for studying uh, uh, cancer and oncology and cancer care in Uganda. The cancers that we see in Uganda are not the cancers that affect um, individuals in their um, more advanced years in, the, in their sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth decades. Rather, they're the cancers that we see in the third, fourth and fifth decades. And that um, there are significant differences between the mix of cancers in, in young adults and, and older adults. And so that influences the research we do uh, in Uganda. The Uganda Cancer Institute, uh, our, our proud partner and, and um, our wonderful partner for the 17 years of this uh, collaboration, was founded in 1967 by the Uganda Ministry of Health in collaboration with the US National Cancer Institute. Uh, and it's uh, currently directed by my close colleague, uh, Dr. Jackson Aram. It's a great pleasure uh, to really lead the UCI Fred Hutch uh, collaboration uh, with Dr. Aram. It was, uh, the UCI was among uh, one of the first sites globally to utilize intravenous chemotherapy to treat disseminated cancer. And here's a report that came from the UCI uh, published in The Lancet, November 3rd of 1979, that details the use of intravenous cyclophosphamide to treat uh, Burkitt lymphoma. I just wanted to point out uh, Dr. Charles O. Wenny, who was the first president uh, and director of the um, uh, Uganda Cancer Institute and uh, Jackson, Dr. Jackson Arem's uh, predecessor. Uh, this uh, cancer research center that uh, we've built with the UCI on their campus is the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. As I think uh, Johnny said, it's a 25,000 square foot facility that features outpatient clinics, labs, training facilities. We have a number of clinics that take place in the building, for those for adult KS, gynecologic oncology, hemalignancies, and also the pediatric cancer hemon clinic is there. On the third floor, we've got labs uh, um, focused on specimen processing with a, a beautiful biorepository. We have a molecular diagnostics lab, beautiful histopathology lab. We have BSL-2 capability because we 
um, actually do a lot of manipulation of tissues from uh, individuals with HIV infection um, and high viral loads, as well as other pathogens that have, say, active uh, tuberculosis. We've also got a genomics lab. We have a, a, an aluminomyceic sequencing there, sequencer there, and hope to build out a, an immunology lab in the future. The major focus of the UCI Fed Hedge collaboration is training of oncology providers at, at both the uh, uh, physician and the nurse level, and as well as, as research scientists. The mix of cancers that we see at the Uganda Cancer Institute is um, uh, kind of suggested here. Cervical cancers, the most common uh, malignancy that uh, 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 is observed, KS is very common. Breast cancer is likewise very common. Um, there isn't a subtype of malignancy seen at the UCI uh, of which a small fraction um, is uh, not HIV uh, uh, positive. So uh, to avoid the double negative, Every type of cancer we see at the UCI um, includes a population uh, of patients with HIV infection, uh, which makes um, the studies that we do on HIV-associated cancers, both the AIDS-defining cancers and the non-AIDS-defining cancers, all the more important. Um, it would take me hours, really, to give, do justice uh, and describe the full breadth and depth of the studies, the research studies that we're doing at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Um, suffice it to say that I think our research portfolio really spans the entire breadth of the cancer research uh, continuum from biology to prevention, detection and diagnosis, treatment, and, and, and yes, I think even public health. Unfortunately, I really don't have time to discuss all of these areas with you. I've, I've chosen then to really highlight some of the research areas that are interesting or novel, um, but um, please forgive me for not talking about some of the exciting research programs that we have, one of which is the uh, program that is develop, uh, focused on uh, developing new diagnostics, in particular, uh, liquid biopsies to follow uh, individuals um, to make the diagnosis and, and monitor individuals uh, uh, with cancer that we can't really access very readily uh, with the resources at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. I won't be able to touch uh, as much about the prevention efforts or the public health efforts, but I do want to talk about a couple of clinical trials that we're, uh, we have going on, as well as some very exciting studies uh, focused on uh, infections in cancer patients. And so um, I hope, and, and I, that I think actually have, have global health uh, and global public health implications. So hopefully you'll appreciate those. Um, one of the most common pediatric cancers seen at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center is the eponymous uh, Burkitt uh, lymphoma that was named by Dennis Burkett, and in fact, first described from uh, Mulago Hospital down the hill from the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center uh, uh, in um, 1958, I think this was. Um, and um, over the following decade, one of the um, important observations that Dr. Burkett and his colleagues made is that the geographic distribution of Burkitt lymphoma mirrored very closely the geographic distribution of holoendemic P. falciparum malaria uh, in Eastern and uh, Southeastern Africa. Here's some, uh, some uh, paper from, uh, data from a paper he published, he and others published in 1970 that really brought that, um, that correlation home. I would point out to you that one of the uh, types of cancers that they cataloged um, in their studies in the 1960s was indeed Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, and so I uh, wanted to make the point to you that Kaposi's sarcoma, the endemic form, has uh, been observed in East Africa uh, uh, for quite some time and certainly preceded uh, the advent of the HIV epidemic um, that occurred um, really um, uh, in the early 1980s. Um, here, the maps of the African continent really show the more or less coexisting distributions of holoendemic malaria and endemic Burkitt lymphoma. The uh, contribution that malaria makes 
to the pathogenesis of uh, pediatric endemic Burkitt lymphoma really remains to be completely unraveled. It's an important scientific question that uh, uh, has gotten a lot of attention, but um, still hasn't yielded entirely to all those efforts. There are a couple of other uh, hallmarks of Burkitt lymph pediatric Burkitt lymphoma, namely one, the presence of Epstein-Barr virus in 90 to 95% of cases, at least in the, the pediatric endemic form that's seen in Uganda. Uh, and in fact, uh, Michael Epstein and, excuse me, Yvonne Barr first identified the virus that later became known as Epstein-Barr virus in a culture of Burkitt lymphoma um, lymphoblasts that were brought, carried physically to the Middlesex Hospital Medical School by Dennis Burkitt from one of his patients uh, in Kampala. Most of you all know, it's you picked up in medical school that the uh, molecular genetic hallmark, diagnostic hallmark of Burkitt lymphoma are uh, balanced translocations that uh, juxtapose the MYC oncogene on the long arm of chromosome eight with one of the three immunoglobulin loci, either the heavy chain locus on the long arm of chromosome 14 or the kappa or lambda light chain loci on, um, uh, sorry, on chromosomes eight, uh, sorry, uh, two and 22 respectively. And the net result of these balanced chromosomal translocations is to put the MYC oncogene under the influence of a very potent uh, enhancer um, that exists in, or, or enhancers that exists in all three of these immunoglobulin uh, gene loci and is very active uh, in B lymphocytes, which then leads to um, high level uh, MYC overexpression. The UCI Fred Hutch collaboration contributed, um, made a uh, really a singular contribution to a, a very important study that was funded primarily by the Division of Cancer Genomics at the US National Cancer Institute. This was the Burkitt Lymphoma Genome Sequencing Project the results of which were published in Blood a couple of years ago. Uh, that was a beautiful study that uh, really um, uh, explained um, much of what we, or, or really established much of what we've uh, learned to date about endemic Burkitt lymphoma. Um, in particular, they made observations about the role of Epstein-Barr virus in the pathogenesis of pediatric Burkitt lymphoma in Africa. They saw that in the EBP positive BL tumors, there was increased expression of uh, adenosine, uh, activation-induced uh, adenosine uh, deaminase, uh, which is an enzyme involved in somatic hypermutation of immunoglobulin receptor genes. And that increased expression was also dysregulated. And so the, uh, the imprint and the signature of somatic hypermutation is not just uh, seen in the immunoglobulin receptor genes, but throughout the genome of these tumors. There are the mutational signatures for the increased activity of this gene, and there are also signs of defective mismatch repair. Importantly, the number of driver mutations uh, in these tumors was actually uh, less than in the EBV negative uh, uh, tumors. That's very important because um, it's, uh, it's a theme in pathogen uh, associated cancers that we've also started to see in uh, Kaposi sarcoma. And uh, decreased expression of, or, or function in apoptotic genes, overexpression of MYC typically uh, uh, puts cells, position cells to undergo apoptosis. Um, and in fact, additional mutations are required to, to um, uh, subvert that predisposition to apoptosis and turn it into a, uh, into a proliferative drive. One of the um, interesting and unexpected findings of the Burkitt Lymphoma Genome Sequencing Project was the identification of a gene called DDX3X, an X chromosome gene, as the gene that was second, um, uh, the second most frequently mutated gene uh, in this particular cancer, second only to MYC itself. 
So DDX3X for some of those, uh, for some of you who may know, is actually, it encodes a multifunctional ATP dependent RNA helicase. Uh, the structure is here. It's got two rec A domains. Um, mutation, somatic mutation in DDX3X is not only identified in Burkitt lymphoma, but in another other uh, types of lymphoid cancer, including NK T cell lymphoma, which is also uh, essentially 100% EBV associated, T cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, chronic and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, congenital mutation, uh, heterozygous haplo um, insufficiency for DDX reX because it's a um, it's an essential gene uh, results in um, uh, uh, severe intellectual di di disability uh, and uh, congenital malformations. Um, the 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 enzymatic activity. Uh, that for which DDX3X is uh, uh, um, most, um, you know, most best known is really prying apart either RNA, RNA uh, duplexes um, or RNA, DNA hybrids. And it does this uh, in an ATP dependent fashion. And so the observation that this ATP dependent RNA helicase was significantly and, and very commonly mutated in Burkitt lymphoma seen in children in Africa was really uh, quite puzzling. And so that caught the attention of a graduate student in my lab, Michael Cargill, who uh, just got his PhD uh, last summer. Michael really wanted to look into uh, the question of whether DDX3X might be involved in DNA double strand break repair. And that was the focus of his thesis studies. Um, I don't have time to tell you about all that, but the, the, work, that, uh, the work that Michael did really has uh, made it entirely plausible and really strongly supported um, the hypothesis that uh, DDX, the gene product of DDX does indeed uh, play an important role in DNA double strand break repair uh, and that mutation or, or hypo function of DDX3X might be uh, the reason why it's associated with cancer. So in this particular experiment, what Michael did is to take HEC 293 cells, 293T, micro irradiate them, a tiny little spot. That micro irradiation causes DNA double strand breaks. Uh, the location of that micro irradiation is indicated uh, in these images, which show you where Q70 localizes. Q70 is one of the two components of the Q complex that uh, binds uh, ends uh, of DNA double strand breaks. Uh, the Q complex is um, uh, important, uh, in fact, uh, required for non-homologous end joining. It's also uh, notably involved, required for VDJ recombination in BNT cells. And as you can see, um, with pretty similar kinetics, when you induce double strand DNA breaks with microwave radiation in these cells, you recruit Q70 to the sites of those breaks and um, uh, very quickly thereafter and very specifically you recruit uh, DDX3X. And Michael went on to show uh, in another of, uh, a number of other experiments that there's very good reason to think that this ATP dependent DNA, uh, sorry, RNA helicase um, is involved in double strand uh, DNA break repair and explaining why it's um, commonly mutated in a lot of lymphoid cancers. I wanna switch the focus now for a second on Kaposi sarcoma. It's a very common cancer as I've uh, shown you and causes a lot of morbidity and mortality in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in Uganda. It's very difficult to study for all the reasons that I've indicated on the right-hand side of the side here. It's the prototypic pathogen associated malignancy um, it is caused by infection with a human herpes virus, human herpes virus 8, a gamma herpes virus whose closest cousin is actually Epstein-Barr virus. And like EBV, it enters the body, we think, through the oral cavity, uh, disseminates into the vascular uh, uh, compartment, and then uh, causes uh, a, um, uh, a, a, an infection of endothelial cells leading to um, macroscopic KS tumors. Unlike EBV, HHV8 or KSHV seroprevalence is globally heterogeneous. If you took a seroprevalence survey here in Seattle, you'd probably get less than 10% who are positive. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, the rates of HHV8 seroprevalence certainly exceed 70% in most populations that have been studied to date. 
and why HHV8 is so different and uh, contrasts so enormously from EBV uh, in this way remains to be explained. Mortality for KS uh, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa remains very high. This is a, a, a clinical study comparing bleomycin and vincristine uh, to paclitaxel. Uh, this is the best case scenario, a clinical trial setting. Uh, real world results, as I'll show you, aren't, uh, aren't even this good. Um, the uh, studies that we do at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center on KS are really um, founded on a, a brilliant prospective study of uh, patients with KS, uh, HIV negative and positive, presenting to the UCI uh, for treatment. And uh, this, this prospective study called HIPPOS is really the life work of Warren Phipps, uh, uh, an associate professor in AID. And um, it really has provided the foundation for an, uh, just a large number of studies that have led to um, a really far better understanding of KS and, and what causes it. Uh, the first 200, uh, the survival of the first 200 patients on this trial is indicated here. The HIV negative patients, the endemic, those with endemic disease uh, survive significantly uh, longer and better than the HIV positive uh, uh, subjects. And we're still really teasing apart uh, the differences there. One of the studies that Warren Phipps and Peter Mucha, Peter's the, uh, the brilliant study coordinator who leads uh, the studies at the UCI Fetish Cancer Center. It's whole exome sequencing that they've undertaken uh, with uh, Ethel Sesserman's group at Weill Cornell Medical College. As I said, like EBV um, and Burkitt, lymph uh, Burkitt lymphoma, um, they don't see a lot of mutations in these tumors, um, uh, but there are a subset with uh, mutations of key genes um, suggesting that there's definitely some complexity to the genetic architecture of KS and something that we intend to study uh, far more intensively in the future. Studies that uh, uh, Warren has done in collaboration with Jim Mullins in the UW Microbiology Department and um, uh, all the work done by Clement Santiago, a recent PhD in the micro department, has looked at um, the HHV8 genomes in Kaposi's sarcoma tumors and really, uh, as uh, beautifully described in this recent PLOS pathogens uh, uh, paper, um, uh, identified some uh, alterations in the HHV8 genome, which we think could possibly be involved in the pathogenesis of, of KS. Other studies that are uh, ongoing of KS include really looking at the immune landscape, the non-tumor cells in KS lesions, the T cells, macrophages, and other cells, B cells that are present. Uh, these studies have been spearheaded by Vestin Thorson, who's a uh, co uh, collaborator from the ISB here in Seattle and have shown that um, uh, using a framework that uh, Vestin uh, really established in the, um, the Immune Landscape of Cancer Project that looked at 10,000 tumors uh, in the TCGA collection that the immune landscape of KS really is dominated by two subtypes, the interferon gamma subtype uh, and the inflammatory subtype, all the green and yellow boxes here. And um, that has uh, uh, led us to um, really um, start pursuing a number of hypotheses about pathogenesis and hopefully treatment. We're also very interested in the T cells that the tumor infiltrating T cells uh, that in, um, infiltrate KS lesions. I just presented this structure of a T cell receptor uh, contacting a peptide MHC complex to remind you that the complementarity determining regions of the T cell receptor that really determine antigenic specificity are encoded by unique, um, uniquely rearranged segments of DNA that can serve as molecular barcodes. And so we can follow these barcodes both in bulk sequencing studies and single cell sequencing studies, which are uh, comprise the majority of what we're doing right now to demonstrate that CD8 positive T cells are very common in KS lesions. And in fact, um, they can be detected in multiple different tumors from non-contiguous sites of the body and in multiple tumors over prolonged periods of time. And uh, to date, these are really the best evidence for a, um, a KS specific 
uh, CD8 positive mediated T cell response that we think has pathogenetic imp uh, importance as well as potential uh, therapeutic relevance. I'm going to switch just in a few uh, for a few minutes to talk about the clinical trials that we've got going. There's a really a brilliant trial of uh, breast cancer um, that's being led by Dr. Oram uh, and uh, really the, the individuals that are spearheading this work are Nixon Nianzima from the UCI and Manoj Manan uh, from the Department of Medicine. There are three, three aims to characterize a molecular portrait of breast cancer in Uganda. That's in collaboration uh, with Eric Connick uh, in Department of Laboratory Medicine. Uh, develop some new molecular technologies to improve diagnosis of breast cancer in Uganda. And then uh, in a clinical aim to look at the feasibility of an oral, oral chemotherapy regimen for the treatment of locally advanced breast cancer in Ugandan women. Another very exciting trouble, uh, trial that's uh, uh, ongoing is being led by Henry Dungu of the UCI and Tom Aldrich of the Hutch and the Department of Medicine. And that's looking at the use of subcutaneous rituximab. Rituximab for all, uh, uh, for all of you is what I call vitamin R. It's transform one of the drugs that's transformed the practice of oncology uh, since it's uh, 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 FDA approval in 1997. Um, uh, we can't treat B-cell lymphomas without it, but uh, typically it's given intravenously. That's very difficult, resource intensive, and um, uh, we think we can actually do a far better job with uh, uh, less resources with subcutaneous rituximab. And so this trial is looking at deploying subcutaneous rituximab uh, in the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center setting. Um, I, I wanted to save some of the most exciting research uh, for last. Uh, this is some research being done by one of our young Ugandan uh, investigators, uh, Dr. Margaret Lubwama. She's a microbiologist and doing a PhD in our D43 funded uh, training program. And she's looking at identifying bacterial causes of neutropenic fever among cancer patients in Uganda. This under the supervision of Warren Phipps and uh, several other uh, AID members. Um, uh, Margie's now looked at over 500 patients, but in the update that she provided last October, um, they uh, were able to identify uh, a large number of individuals with neutropenic fever at the UCI in whom uh, positive blood cultures uh, uh, were observed. Those positive blood cultures contained uh, or uh, involved an, an alarming number of antimicrobial resistant gram negative species. And in fact, 61% um, displayed and expended, uh, demonstrated an extended spectrum beta lactamase uh, producing phenotype. 54% uh, um, had the um, uh, ESBL uh, uh, genotype, uh, of which 32 had um, the. Uh, ESBL uh, CTXM gene that can um, uh, uh, contribute uh, to um, enable the ESBL phenotype. 24% um, were carbapenem resistant. So um, the importance of this can't be overstated because um, many of these isolates are resistant at the start, at the get-go from the antibiotics that we have available at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. And of course, it only takes uh, uh, one plane flight from, for these organisms to uh, move elsewhere in the globe. And so we think that these studies have enormous implications for uh, global health security. security. Bacteremia in these patients is associated with very poor survival outcomes. And, and we, we hope that Maggie continues these studies. She's well positioned. She just got a, uh, UW Fred Hutch CIFAR uh, award to continue them and uh, is trying to, is in the process of uh, developing a K43 uh, career development award to continue these studies. And we'd like to see others follow in her footsteps. I, I, I can't think of uh, 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 an individual who better exemplifies the kind of research that we're trying to do in Kampala than, than Maggie Lubwama. Training is another, uh, really one of our foci uh, in Kampala. In 2018, as I uh, told you, we, in collaboration with the UCI, 
um, established the East African Adult Hematology Oncology Fellowship Program. That's been funded by the African Development Bank, uh, co-led by Abraham Zomading of the UCI and our own John Harlan, former uh, uh, director chair of the Division of Hematology in the Department of Medicine. First class of four fellows have already finished their two-year fellowships and uh, the second class of three fellows matriculated uh, last November. Uh, training continues to be a very, very busy Hutch activity at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Um, uh, responsibility for coordinating a lot of those training programs lies on the shoulders of Warren Phipps, as I said, an associate professor uh, in AID, who's been based um, in Kampala, living there since uh, uh, 2007, 2008. And um, uh, I can't thank Warren enough for uh, the enormous effort he's uh, contributed over the years to develop, to really keep, to develop and, and uh, grow this training program. We also have an oncology nursing training program, and that's been led by uh, Kathleen Shannon Darcy and Arliss Kumar, two nurse educators from the uh, Division of Oncology and the SCCA. And um, I, I always say that, you know, oncologists are a dime a dozen, but uh, oncology trained um, uh, capable oncology nurses are worth their weight in any precious metal um, that you can name. And um, we need more of them uh, in Uganda and the rest of the world needs more of them. And so I can't uh, tell you how important this particular effort is. Um, we support clinical care at the Uganda Cancer Institute in a number of different ways, tumor boards, uh, uh, teaching sessions. We have a medical supply programs. We actually do... Um, uh, here in Seattle at the Fred Hutch uh, testing for BCR able uh, for patients with su uh, suspected uh, CML. Little bits of blood are put on, are, are blotted on dried blood spark cards and, and uh, uh, sent to Seattle. And there's enough RNA remaining when they get here uh, to look uh, at uh, whether there's BCR able and uh, if so, whether it's mutated. Um, we're also very much focused on expanding our lab capacity at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. As I told you, we now have, uh, thanks to a generous contribution from a local Seattle biotech and aluminumiseq sequencer, and we're doing targeted sequencing of the MHC, of the antigen receptor um, uh, uh, loci, and hope to expand that in the very new future to other parts of the human genome. And um, this effort is, um, um, uh, in great deal uh, um, to be attributed to Andrea Tallerton, who's um, the director of our uh, laboratory there and uh, whose efforts um, have been uh, absolutely spectacular in uh, making our lab what it is. I just wanted to comment in the last couple of minutes um, before I wrap up that um, uh, just as everyone else, uh, we have struggled with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic in Kampala at the UCI Fred Hutch Cancer Center. The, the pandemic is tracing a very unique trajectory in Africa, as you can see from the, from the WHO COVID-19 uh, uh, dashboard. There have been two peaks of, of, of COVID activity uh, in Africa. Uh, one occurred in July and then one over the uh, December, January holidays. There's a temporary lull. It's exploding once again uh, in Kenya right now, which is uh, just to the east of Uganda. The isolates that have been observed in Africa, which are few in number, there's been less than 5% of the sequences contributed to GISAID actually uh, have come from uh, African patients. And so there's enormous need for, for uh, better genomic epidemiology and surveillance. Uh, but um, one of the most worrisome variants is the B1351 variant, first identified in South Africa. Um, it's now the predominant uh, isolate in Zimbabwe and likely to become the predominant isolate uh, throughout the rest of the African continent, probably within the next three months. Vaccination um, uh, is obviously one of the, uh, one of the answers. And uh, unfortunately, the resources and the infrastructure and, um, and a lot of other um, requisites for uh, pushing that vaccination agenda forward um, aren't yet really in place in Africa. The number of vaccine doses administered per 100 people on, as of a couple days ago was uh, about uh, 0 0.1. So there's about one in a thousand. 
um, share of the population fully vaccinated uh, as of a couple of days ago. Um, uh, there's very uh, small fraction of the population, really less than uh, less than one tenth of one percent of the population. That's certainly true in Uganda, where the number of vaccinated people is about forty five thousand. So I'm just going to wrap up with this thought. Um, you know, my my motivation and and the the ethos that really drives me and and uh, motivates me to do my work is really captured in this quote from Norman Borlaug. Uh, Norman Borlaug, sorry, uh, is this. Uh, tall gentleman in the middle of this picture. He's probably the most important person of the 20, 20th century that no one's ever heard of. So he's my, my hero. Uh, he won the 1971 Nobel Peace Prize for uh, his contributions to the Green Revolution. Um, it's, it's often said that uh, the high yield strains, pest resistant, drought, drought resistant strains he developed on this agricultural work uh, research station outside Mexico City called CIMIT averted the starvation of hundreds of millions of people in the 1960s and 70s. And obviously we're not gonna have the impact that Norman Borlaug did, but um, we follow in his footsteps and, and making that kind of impact and, and importantly teaching um, uh, others to, to uh, really take the flag and, um, and continue the work is, is our goal. And so I thought I'd leave you with that particular thought. Uh, there are a lot of people to thank, um, many at the UCI, many at the Fred Hodge. The research that I've done, uh, that my lab has done, has been generously funded by NCI and other sources. And uh, it would take me 10 minutes to thank everybody adequately. And so um, for those who are not listed on the slide, uh, you know who you are. Um, um, I'm just as thankful. Um, and, um, and I thank you for uh, the, your attention, and uh, I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Warren. What an incredible talk and an exemplary uh, demonstration of collaboration and scientific advancement uh, in your partnership with the UCI. Just a couple minutes here uh, for any quick questions. If anyone has any, feel free to, to ask in the chat. So um, I'm not sure if you saw that question, but I, I, I just a, could you muse or speculate on why you think there might be that connection that you mentioned that's uh, been tough to elucidate between malaria and Burkitt's lymphoma? <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful question. Um, you, you know, um, malaria is such a complicated infection and it clearly uh, is immunosuppressive. Um, uh, the, the, the B cells that are transformed in Burkitt lymphoma bear, uh, are antigen experienced and they, uh, their B cell receptors uh, bear the evidence of extensive somatic hypermutation. So they've, they've encountered antigen going back to the germinal center, undergone affinity maturation, somatic hypermutation um, many, many, many times. And um, the process of somatic hypermutation involves uh, double-stranded DNA breaks. And, um, uh, and in the setting, in the right genetic uh, uh, setting, um, aberrant repair of one of those double-strand DNA breaks could give rise to a translocation, juxtaposing MYC with uh, the immunoglobulin loci uh, in some wayward B cell. And um, repeated episodes of clinical and subclinical malaria might be just that kind of repeated infectious pathogen challenge to drive that process. So uh, that's uh, wholesale speculation, Johnny. I <laughs> best I can do in April of 2021. That's fair. I think we were, at, we were asking for you to wholesale speculate. So that was a wonderful answer. Mm -hmm. um, we're approaching the end of the hour. Uh, uh, one more question coming in here. Um, is, is whole gen genome sequencing being used for precision oncology medicine, maybe here, particularly in the Western developed world? Yeah, so um, pre precision oncology and um, uh, is increasingly uh, availing itself of whole genome sequencing. 
Um, whole genome sequencing is still a little bit too complicated and too expensive, takes too much work. Targeted sequencing for the known actionable mutations really is, um, is the foundation of precision oncology at the moment. Um, but uh, there's a lot of feeling in the field right now that the best approach um, might be whole genome sequencing. Um, and as the price of a whole genome continues to sink well below $1,000, um, that might, which is really, really cheap compared to $3,500 for a flow cytometric study, um, that might be the way to go. I would just add that um, uh, targeted sequencing of uh, hemoligamencies is one of those pilot projects at the UCI that um, was put on the back burner by the pandemic, but which mm. we're ramping back up and hopefully um, we will activate uh, any day now, really in the spring of of 2021. So um, we do think there's enormous potential for, uh, for sequencing approaches to um, improve the diagnosis and the monitoring of cancer in areas such as Uganda, where talented, uh, talented medical professionals and their teams with who have um, expensive fiber optic scopes that they can put into some body orifice and snake their way to a a, a tumor site and grab a little snippet are, are few and far between. And there won't be a lot more of those kind of people anytime soon. So developing uh, liquid biopsy diagnostics uh, makes enormous sense, we think, in, in uh, low-income countries. Awesome and incredible presentation, as has been noted a number of times in the chat. Thank you so much for your time and, and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and have a wonderful rest of your Friday afternoon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Take care. Thanks, Hootie, again.